Okay, I'm Cindy Kelly. It is November 17, 2016, and I'm in Chicago, Illinois, and I'm with Peter Vandervoort. I would like first to ask Peter to say his name and spell it. I am Peter Oliver Vandervoort. Vandervoort has now been spelled in an Americanized way, V-A-N-D-E-R, V O O R T. Great, thank you. Um, before we get into your, you know, personal history, uh, I would like you to kind of give us a little tour, help us with um, identifying the people <coughs> and activities associated with the various properties uh, on campus uh, that were associated with the Manhattan Project. The Quadrangle Club is the faculty club of the university. Um, the dining room was a venue for almost daily luncheons for many years, uh, attended by uh, physicists and chemists. Uh, that was a very strong tradition. And the club was used um, for by other groups, and uh, in particular, uh, there was a uh, faculty group that met mo monthly during the academic year uh, for dinner and for a t research talk uh, by one of its members. And one of the interesting things, perhaps the first discussion uh, that preceded the metallurgical lab uh, occurred, as far as I can tell, in May of 1940 when Samuel Allison gave a talk to the club entitled U-235 and all that. Um, that was in that period between the discovery of nuclear fission and the uh, imposition of censorship by the government on public discussions of uh, nuclear research. So there was this window of public discussion of um, nuclear fission and its potential as an energy source and its potential as a, uh, as a weapon uh, that was probably fairly public uh, for a year or two before the uh, curtain of secrecy uh, came down. Uh, an interesting bit of history, Leo Zillard lived in the Quadrangle Club for a few years. Uh, so it was a place where the uh, veterans of the Manhattan Project, the participants of the Manhattan Project, met regularly for lunch, and uh, presumably their discussions were uh, not sensitive from the point of view of the uh, Met Lab, but uh, they became a community uh, around the uh, lunch tables. Eckert Hall. Um, I was a student uh, in the university from 1951 to 1960, and in my time, uh, Eckert Hall uh, was the home of the departments of physics and mathematics. It was built around 1930, uh, which was essentially the second building boom on the campus of the university after its foundation. Uh, it's interesting in the history of the Met Lab because it was appropriated uh, for use as the administrative building of the, um, of the Met Lab. And uh, I mentioned in connection with the Quadrangle Club that we had a faculty group that met for dinner and uh, um, uh, t talks, lectures. But um, when I was secretary of that club, oh no, when I looked up the records of that club, I discovered that uh, I had a t typescript of the membership of the club, and office addresses were typed in, but then a number had been corrected by hand, and for example, uh, Sam Allison had moved from Ryerson, another physics building, to Eckert at one point. The mathematicians had been moved out of Eckert Hall and were now located in other offices on the campus. So suddenly the use of Eckert changed very uh, abruptly 
with the uh, beginning of the Met Lab. And as I say, Eckert was the uh, administrative building for the uh, metallurgical lab. Um, there is a rather iconic photograph of participants in the Manhattan Project that was taken on the front steps of Eckert Hall, I believe around 1946, in any case at the end of uh, the Second World War. And that photograph contains a number of the participants in Fermi's experiment to bring the Chicago Pile 1 to criticality. But there were other members of the Manhattan Project that were in that photograph who had not been present at the first chain reaction, but who were very much involved with the development of reactor physics. Sam Allison was um, a member of the physics department from the 1930s until his death in the early 1960s. When he came to Chicago, he was an X-ray physicist. He collaborated with Arthur Compton on a book on uh, X-ray physics, but in the late 30s, his interests began to shift to nuclear physics. Um, I'm proud to have been a student of Sam Allison in one of his classes. Uh, he was on my dissertation committee, uh, and uh, it is just a privilege to be at an institution where one can know such extraordinary people. Leo Szilard was a very remarkable uh, physicist, but uh, I would say a contrarian. Uh, he was not particularly gifted in hands-on experimental work, but he was very imaginative and indeed he foresaw, the, in a sense, the discovery of nuclear fission. And before the discovery or the observation of fission, he imagined the uh, construction of a nuclear reactor. And therefore, at the time of the metallurgical lab, he already had patents on <laughs> the process. Um, he, as I say, he was very much a character. Uh, later in his career, he became interested in biophysics. Uh, he wrote some rather charming science fiction and was very much um, a uh, member of the university. Uh, he was very much uh, an advocate for the control of nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, processes. And in particular, um, I think he was one of the leaders in uh, the uh, discussion as to whether or not the uh, atomic bomb should be used during the Second World War. And I think that he was one of the uh, inter intellectual leaders of the uh, group that favored uh, careful control and very restrained use of nuclear energy on this campus. A number of buildings on the campus were uh, put under security. There were guards. There was very limited access. Uh, in particular, the two physics buildings, Eckert, that we've already discussed, and Ryerson, uh, the uh, other physics building, uh, were uh, appropriated. Eckert for administration, Ryerson for physics. And then the two chemistry buildings, uh, Kent and then Jones, were also appropriated for chemistry. And those buildings were under guard. Uh, a colleague of mine was here as an undergraduate in 1943-44, and he do, does recall that uh, those buildings were secured. Were these armed guards? That I don't know, but my guess is that they could well have been. They they very much. They might very well have been um, U.S. Army uh, military police. Um, after all, uh, Leslie Groves, General Groves, was head of the Manhattan Project. And so, in a sense, it was a program of the United States Army. Um, maybe we should uh, just take a quick second to 
uh, talk about what was, you keep talking about the Met Lab and the Metallurgical Laboratory. Can you tell us a little more when it gets started, who headed it? The, the university's contribution to the Manhattan Project was organized <laughs> under uh, the so-called Metallurgical Laboratory. Uh, the uh, name was chosen to obscure the fact that it was the venue for nuclear research leading to uh, various applications of nuclear fission. Uh, it was referred to by uh, the community as the Met Lab quite often. And so uh, in uh, connection with uh, these, these uh, discussions, uh, when we say the Met Lab, we do mean the metallurgical lab, and uh, we do mean the contribution of the University of Chicago to the Manhattan Project. Um, Arthur Holly Compton, who uh, was a very distinguished member of the physics department, uh, a Nobel laureate uh, in X-ray physics, um, important discoveries that advanced the development of quantum theory. Uh, he was uh, at one point head of the physics department and then uh, dean. Um, I'm not sure if his deanship was restricted to the physical sciences or it covered the biological sciences as well. Uh, there was a reorganization of the university under Robert Maynard Hutchins. And, uh, but at any rate, from our point of view, uh, Arthur Compton was perhaps the uh, leading member of the physics community on the campus at that time. Um, and uh, he was the uh, scientific leader of the university's involvement in the Manhattan Project. Uh, early in the project, uh, they, they were setting up laboratories at Columbia University, Fermi and Szilard, did uh, early work at Columbia University, and then were moved to Chicago. Uh, uh, and the Met Lab was established, and uh, the Met Lab was a cover, that is to say, um, uh, it would not have done to have uh, called it the uh, nuclear research lab or anything of that sort, it would have been a giveaway. So. Um, the metallurgical lab is notorious on campus as having been the scientific venue for our research in the Manhattan Project, but uh, it was, uh, uh, it, the name was chosen to, uh, for the sake of security. Uh, interestingly, uh, there was a security, well, a potential security breach through uh, the student newspaper, uh, and I believe it was in connection with their report on uh, Compton's departure to become president of Washington University. And the article said something to, the, as I recall, said something to the effect that Compton's research was involved in breaking up atoms. And uh, the uh, university, or the Manhattan Project security on campus, uh, promptly came in and reprimanded the editor of the student newspaper, the Chicago Maroon. Not only that, they went around campus and appropriated all of the copies of the Maroon that they could lay their hands on. <laughs> so uh, there was a certain sensitivity to, uh, to the security issues. <clears throat> the, the council tree is really uh, connected with the challenge to the scientific participants in the Manhattan Project. Uh, scientists live in a world where, uh, by and large, you uh, discuss everything and you make sure everybody hears the same words. And that's just a culture that does not accommodate to the requirements of security. Well, they did learn, and uh, they did understand that it was important to have sensitive discussions under circumstances in which they would not be overheard. And uh, the practice developed 
of going outside Eckert Hall. Uh, in front of Eckert Hall, there was a tree that came to be known as the council tree. And uh, very often when participants in the Met Lab had some sensitive material to discuss, they would go out and stand by that tree uh, with some confidence that they could have a discussion on very sensitive issues with very little uh, chance of being overheard by the wrong people. That tree continued to exist uh, until the administration of Edward Levy as president. So we must be talking about the uh, late 1960s or early 1970s when the tree died. And uh, it was a bit of a shock to people, and uh, there was a little bit of mourning over the loss of the tree. The uh, tree was very carefully removed, and enough lumber was uh, preserved to construct a bench, which has now been in various locations on campus and is known as the uh, council bench. The, uh, the bench that was constructed from the uh, council, lumber of the council tree is at this time located in the lobby of the um, uh, Jones Chemistry Laboratory. I mentioned uh, earlier that Eckert Hall was constructed around 1930 as part of the second building boom on the campus of the university. Ryerson, uh, a, an older building located just to the west of Eckert, was, one of, was the first physics building on the campus of the university, built around 1894. Uh, it was uh, the scientific home of a very uh, distinguished group of scientists. Uh, Albert Michelson worked there, Millikan worked there, Compton worked there. Um, Robert Mulliken, um, a faculty member in my time as a student, uh, was there. Um, and it, as I say, it was the uh, physics building uh, at, at the beginning of the uh, university. Um, Eckert and Ryerson are now used mainly for the departments of mathematics, statistics, and computer science. The physical sciences have moved to more modern facilities elsewhere on campus. Um, one of the, uh, well, in my time there were two very distinguished members of the um, physics department, uh, William Zachariason and Robert Mulliken, who were located in that building. Um, and I had connections with both of them. Uh, Zachariasen was a um, physicist from Norway. He was a very distinguished X-ray crystallographer. And as part of the Manhattan Project, he was responsible for the exploration of the uh, chemical and metallurgical structure of the transuranic elements that were produced as a result of the uh, Manhattan Project. So he played an extremely important role in establishing the basic science uh, underlying the chemical and physical behavior of the transuranic elements uh, discovered or created in the process of the Manhattan Project. Um, I had a course in mathematics from Zachariasen. He gave the entire series of lectures without a note. He made one mistake on the blackboard, muttered damn, corrected it, and completed the lecture and completed the course. Now, another member of the Manhattan Project who actually was uh, uh, a very young member, he completed his PhD after the Second World War, was Mark Ingram. And uh, when I read Mark Ingram's uh, essay in the biographical memoirs of the National Academy of Sciences, he described taking a course from Zacharias in, in mechanics. 
Zachariason would come into the room with a notebook that he would put on the table, but rarely opened. In Ingram's recollection, Zachariason opened the notebook once. He was disturbed about a formula that he had written on the blackboard, and he opened the notebook to check what his notes said, and he realized that what he had on the blackboard was correct, but it was in a form different from what he had in his notebook. And I was very gratified by the parallel of Mark Ingram's story and my story, because Mark Ingram was the chairman of the candidacy examination committee uh, with which I uh, became a candidate for the PhD. Um, just a comment, um, many veterans of the Manhattan Project were uh, my, uh, my mentors and teachers, uh, so I know more about the veterans than I do about the, uh, the project. I mentioned Robert Mulliken, he was a very distinguished um, expert in atomic and molecular physics. He was a Nobel laureate. Um, he was uh, a member of the examination committee, on which I got admitted to the PhD candidacy. And he was the thesis advisor of Leona Marshall Libby. So these connections just accumulate. <laughs> um, well, as I say, uh, Ryerson is now given over to, mainly to computer science and uh, statistics. The next building is the Kent Chemical Laboratory. Kent was the first chemistry building built on the campus of the university, so it dates from the uh, 1890s. Uh, it is a contemporary of, of Ryerson. Uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, Kent and Ryerson were the first part of the first building boom on the campus. Uh, Eckert and the Jones Chemical Laboratory uh, were part of the second building boom. The first building boom was the 1890s. The second one was uh, 1930, plus or minus a, a couple of years. Um, Kent, as I say, was the principal uh, chemistry building for many years. It is now uh, it serves it now serves mainly as um, uh, a venue for uh, instruction. The uh, instructional laboratories and most of the lecture and seminar rooms are there. And was it uh, used in the Manhattan Project? Uh, Kent and the uh, second chemistry building, Jones, were both appropriated for chemistry uh, during the Manhattan Project. So that line of buildings, uh, ranging from Eckert at the east end of the block to uh, Jones at the west end of the block, uh, Eckert, Ryerson, Kent, Jones, were all uh, secured for the purposes of the Manhattan Project. The George Herbert Jones Chemical Laboratory was uh, completed around 1928. Uh, it was the more modern chemistry building during my time as a student. Um, it was the, uh, perhaps from the point of view of the history of the Manhattan Project, the most important or significant fact about the Jones Laboratory is that it was on the fourth floor of Jones that uh, a team led by Glenn Seaborg first weighed the very tiny sample of plutonium that had been uh, produced uh, elsewhere. Uh, so uh, it uh, is something of an icon in, or well, it's a it's it's kind of benchmark in the chronology of the uh, Manhattan Project, and and the metallurgical lab. There is now a display connected with the weighing of plutonium in the lobby of the Jones Laboratory, um, and uh, most of that display concentrates on the weighing of of uh, plutonium. However, there are two other objects of some interest. 
Uh, one is a model of Chicago Pile 1 constructed from Lego. Uh, and as far as I can tell, it uh, is a pretty good representation of the shape of the uh, pile. The other uh, artifact in the lobby of Jones is the uh, council bench itself, which was constructed from the tree uh, at which uh, scientific participants in the Met Lab uh, had sensitive discussions for security reasons. Uh, so that lumber uh, undoubtedly heard many very significant sequences coming from the uh, met metallurgical laboratory. <laughs> the physics and chemistry buildings, uh, Eckert, Ryerson, Jones, and uh, Kent, are for all practical purposes located on 58th Street, uh, although uh, they are set back from uh, the, uh, the street because of the uh, uh, geography of the campus. Uh, the West Stands was located along Ellis Avenue between 57th and 56th Street. Uh, it was the um, part of Stagg Field, which was the original athletic field on the campus of the university. Uh, when I was a student, the West Stands loomed over Ellis Avenue. Uh, it was used um, by the James Franck Institute uh, for uh, low temperature physics and in fact it was the venue for the Franck Institute until uh, a proper building was constructed for that institute. When I say the James Franck Institute, I should say it was the institute created as the institute for the study of metals at the end of the Second World War. Um, and then uh, the laboratories for the liberal arts courses in the natural sciences were located on the second floor of the West Stands during the 1950s. And so I guess I'm one of the last people to be able to claim to have worked in the West Stands before it was demolished. Um, it was a secure site in the same sense that the chemistry and physics buildings were secured. And uh, the uh, Chicago Pile 1 was constructed on the main floor of the West Stands. Uh, the uh, building was eventually taken down. Uh, it has been replaced by uh, a number of other structures. And in particular, it is the site of the sculpture Nuclear Energy by Henry Moore. Um, the West Stands um, was, uh, the West Stands was part of the uh, seating for the University of Chicago's athletic field, Stag Field. Um, Stag Field uh, plus a gymnasium and the North Stands uh, occupied a city block. Um, I, well, by the time of the Second World War, by the time of the Manhattan Project, uh, the university had left the Western Conference, or was leaving the Western Conference, and uh, there was a substantial de-emphasis of intercollegiate athletics. So the stands were available for other purposes. Uh, football had been um, abandoned at the University of Chicago, and so there were very few events that required a massive seating. And um, I guess the point was that the West Ends was um, an industrial quality structure suitable for um, uh, scientific research of the kind that was required uh, for the construction of CP1. Uh, in any case, it was appropriated and secured as part of the metallurgical lab. 
um, and uh, was the venue for the first nuclear chain reaction, the first controlled nuclear chain reaction uh, in December of 1942. So do you remember where the squash court still there when you were a student? I do not remember squash courts in the West Stands. My suspicion is that they had disappeared. Uh, the West Stands was certainly not used as part of the athletic program of the university when I was a student. Um, there were still tennis courts, clay courts, under the North Stands. But I think the West Stands never returned to uh, use by the athletic department. Were the, was there research conducted? Um, the, uh, I was a laboratory teaching assistant in the West Stands in uh, 1953 to probably late 54 or early 55. And um, there was a low temperature facility on the ground floor, uh, which uh, housed a hydrogen liquefying facility. And then, as I say, the undergraduate laboratories for uh, liberal arts courses in the natural sciences uh, were located on the second floor. Um, during my time there, a hydrogen li liquefier similar to the one that we had in the West Stands blew up uh, in the uh, commonly honest laboratory at Leiden University. And when the legal department just realized that we had a similar hydrogen liquefier in the West Stands, the college instructional laboratories were very quickly removed. Chandrasekhar was my mentor. Um, he was another of the Nobel laureates whom I collected around the university. Uh, Chandrasekhar was probably the m most distinguished theoretical astrophysicist in uh, the middle of the 20th century, worldwide. Um, interestingly, I became his student by accident. As I, uh, I was a graduate assistant in the research laboratory of Louis Slowden, uh, no, sorry, of, of Louis Rosen. Uh, uh, let me back up. Uh, Subramanian Chandrasekhar was my PhD thesis supervisor. I was a graduate student research assistant at Los Alamos in the summer of 19. Uh, 56, working in the emulsion laboratory of Louis Rosen at Los, Alam at Los Alamos. Chandra was, uh, Chandra is our nickname for Professor Chandra Sekar. Chandra was at Los Alamos consulting um, on the uh, fusion program that was going on at Los Alamos in the 1950s. Um, I was dithering. Uh, I did not know whether I wanted to do astrophysics or uh, particle physics. And a classmate said, well, tell me what you want to do. And after a moment, I said astrophysics. He said, fine. Chandra is probably the only astrophysics physicist within several hundred miles. Why don't you go talk to him? Uh, my classmate and I had been students in Chandra's class in quantum theory the previous academic year, and uh, I had done reasonably well in the course. Uh, but my reaction was, oh, Chandra doesn't want to talk with me. And my classmate pointed out, he said, well, you have nothing to lose. Worst case scenario, he asks you to leave. You are no worse off than you would be if you didn't see him. So I went to see Chandra. And he remembered me from the course. He asked me what the purpose of my uh, appointment was. And I said that I had decided that uh, I wanted to continue in astrophysics. He said, well, I have two pieces of advice to offer. 
The first is take your PhD in physics. A knowledge of physics will be very important in future discoveries in astronomy. The second is, why don't you work with me? I can offer you an assistantship. <laughs> I've always wondered if I was so inarticulate that I didn't make it clear that I was coming for advice and didn't expect anything more. But again, uh, it's a small world and uh, Los Alamos figures very prominently in my own experience in history. Well, uh, Professor Chandrasekhar, uh, knew Henry Moore, who did the nuclear energy sculpture on the, essentially on the site, at least approximately, of Chicago Pile One. And Chandra once commented that uh, he had been discussing the interpretation of the sculpture with Henry Moore. And uh, Chandra pointed out that many people saw the sculpture as a representation of a uh, mushroom cloud or a skull. Horror's or Homer, or, um, Henry Moore's observation was that uh, that interpretation was rather banal. Um, but interesting, uh, interesting connections. Um, I recall that my wife and I saw a model of the sculpture in the Netherlands when we were there for a uh, sabbatical year. And so we, know what, we knew what we should be looking forward to when we returned to uh, Chicago. Um, again, uh, an op op opportunity for contact with extraordinary people. Uh, so the, the um, sculpture, the sculpture nuclear energy is pretty much on the site of CP1, and uh, it is a tourist attraction. Uh, it's not uncommon to see buses paused there and uh, visitors out taking pictures of the sculpture and taking pictures also of the, um, uh, of the plaques in front of the sculpture that commemorate the first nuclear chain reaction and I think mark the site as a national historical site. We, we even saw a visitor crawling inside the sculpture. You occasionally see young people taking naps there. <laughs> we are now on Woodlawn Avenue uh, at a location a block or two from the main campus of the university in front of what was the home of Professor Arthur Holly Compton. Uh, Professor Compton was the dean of the Division of the Physical Sciences and uh, previous to that, uh, head of the Department of Physics. He was the uh, leading physicist on the campus at that time. He was a specialist in uh, x-ray physics, uh, uh, in which he did work for which he received the Nobel Prize, but at the time of um, the beginning of the Second World War, his interests had switched to cosmic ray phys physics. He was a leading figure in bringing the university into the Manhattan Project and attracting uh, distinguished scientists to the uh, program. Uh, he continued his leadership through the Second World War and eventually um, accepted the presidency of Washington University in, in uh, St. Louis. Um, like many members of the faculty, he had a home in the neighborhood of the university. The university was very proud to be able to say that a large fraction of the faculty lived within walking distance of the campus which meant that the, the members of the faculty, and in particular the members of the, or the veterans of the Manhattan Project, were also neighbors, uh, which, who, sh who shared social and cultural uh, interests in addition to their scientific connections. I don't really know 
the extent of the communication between Compton and Hutchins. Hutchins was, of course, chancellor of the university at the time. And I don't know the uh, extent of the communication between Compton and uh, Hutchins regarding the plans to uh, do the uh, criticality experiments with CP1. Uh, Hutchins must have been known that the reactor was being constructed in the West Stands. Um, and so I cannot imagine that he would not have uh, understood that uh, some serious experiments were contemplated. I could imagine that Hutchins might have preferred not to know too many of the details. Uh, Hutchins, the university benefited at that time from having a leader who was on very good terms with members of the scientific community. And my guess is that Hutchins had a great deal of trust in Compton. Um, I know of other connections in which relations between faculty and Chancellor Hutchins were of the highest quality. Uh, Hutchins was very much involved with what was going on. Um, I'm going to digress. digress. Hutchins took a very friendly view to the development of the physical sciences at the University of Chicago following the Second World War. Uh, he uh, led in the creation of two research institutes, the Institute for Nuclear Studies, which is now the Enrico Fermi Institute, and the Institute for the Study of Metals, which is now the James Franck Institute. Uh, we tend to name things after our Nobel laureates. <laughs> Um, the institutes were created, as I say, at the end of the Second World War, and they were uh, intended to bring together chemists, physicists, geophysicists, biophysicists in a very interdisciplinary setting. And so Hutchins' leadership in continuing the quality of the science done on the campus of the university following the metallurgical laboratory and the Manhattan Project was very important. Um, Willie Zachariasen became chairman of the uh, Department of Physics around 1945. It was right at the end of the Second World War. Prior to Zacharias's administration, the administration of the physics department had been a rather autocratic um, operation. The uh, chairman was a boss, the head of the department was the boss, and was not really expected to consult with others before making important judgments and decisions. Um, Zachariasen turned the physics department into a highly democratic community. And early on, he convened the faculty to discuss new academic appointments in physics. At the end of the meeting, the faculty had agreed to recommend to the university the appointment of Enrico Fermi, Edward Teller, Walter Zinn, Robert Christie, and John Simpson, all veterans of the Manhattan Project to the faculty of the Department of Physics. Zachariasen took the recommendation to Robert Hutchins that afternoon, and by the day, end of the day, Hutchins had improved all five appointments. Uh, so um, one other example, um, Otto Struve was for many years the chairman of the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics and director of the Yerkes Observatory. I'm told that someone once asked Struva, how does it happen that the Department of Astronomy was so well treated during the 1930s when the Depression 
imposed serious ex uh, constraints on the uh, university's budget. Struve is said to have replied, you must understand, astronomy was the only science that Mr. Hutchins understood. Now, uh, I always thought that was a nice fairy tale, but then I came across a published paper by Struve in which he was very generous in his praise of Hutchins for the support that Hutchins had given to the Department of, Nine, of Astronomy and Astrophysics when we joined with the University of Texas for the creation of the McDonald Observatory, which for a number of years was the second largest reflecting telescope in the country. Uh, so Hutchins was a very important player and leader in the uh, pursuit and improvement of science on the campus of the university. And so he has to be listed as one of the important veterans of the Manhattan Project. <laughs> I have to confess I'm a fan of uh, Robert Maynard Hutchins because I benefited from the college curriculum that he and Mortar Adler created. What was that? Um, it was designed to accept students after two years of high school, and it was a program of about three and a half years solely of the liberal arts. Um, interestingly, I learned yesterday at a meeting of the board of the Adler Planetarium that uh, we had sent one of the artifacts from our collection of historical astronomical uh, uh, instruments to uh, the University of Louvain in, um, in Belgium for an exhibit commemorating the 500th, uh, anniversary, 500th year anniversary of the publication of Thomas More's uh, Utopia. My reaction is, I read Utopia in the Hutchins College. <laughs> So at the end of those three and a half years, you get a... You, one, one, one uh, received a, well, I had the ideal, ideal history. I entered the college at the age of 16, after three years of high school. I graduated at the end of my third year, so I was 19, and I had already done my uh, freshman physics. After another year's study, I received a Bachelor of Science degree um, at the age of 20 and a Master's degree at the age of 21. So I was 21 years old, having gotten a Liberal Arts degree and then a, a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics and then a Master of Science in Physics when I had the Summer Assistantship at Los Alamos. So, um, and there's another good thing. Uh, when I was courting Frances, my wife, we had terrible arguments about the philosophy of education. And uh, Fran, who was going off to the University of Michigan, she had just graduated from high school, uh, was very critical of what I was arguing. But I had the advantage. I had Robert Maynard Hutchins on my side. And when she started reading his books, she said, hey, that's pretty good. So she transferred to the University of Chicago after two years at Michigan. <laughs> so she had the best of both worlds, as it turned out. <laughs> Elsewhere on Woodlawn Avenue, this was the home of Enrico and Laura Fermi and their family after the Second World War. Uh, it is one of the grand houses in Hyde Park, again, uh, within a short distance of the university. I, I did not have the privilege of knowing Enrico Fermi. To the best of my recollection, I attended one physics colloquium by uh, Fermi. Uh, I had a, a peripheral interest because Fermi and uh, my uh, teacher Subramanian Chandrasekhar collaborated on some astrophysics papers 
in which I took an interest as a graduate student. And uh, Chandra had a fair number of Fermi stories to, uh, to tell. Uh, but as I say, um, I completed freshman physics in 1954. I should say that John Marshall, uh, another participant in the Met Lab, was my teacher for three quarters of freshman physics. Um, uh, but I had completed freshman physics in 54 and was starting the uh, intermediate level physics courses with Zachariasen and Allison. Uh, Fermi died in 55. Uh, a friend told me, and this must have been late in 55, that there was a position available in what had been Fermi's laboratory for a, an undergraduate to scan nuclear emulsions. So I um, went to, I, well, I went to apply for that position. I was hired by Horace Taft, the son of Senator Robert Taft and the grandson of President William Taft. <laughs> and uh, the leader in that department, uh, for practical purposes, was Arthur Rosenfeld, who for many years was on the physical faculty at Berkeley and eventually involved in significant environmental matters. There was a wonderful group of younger students who were the last generation of Fermi students who completed the, were completing their PhD work under the supervision of other members of the faculty. I worked initially for Jerome Friedman who became a distinguished professor at MIT and received the Nobel Prize in Physics for his work on uh, the uh, discovery of, of uh, the character of the structure of uh, fundamental particles. Um, so it was a very significant research group and the I fondly imagine that the spirit of Enrico Fermi still permeated that laboratory. Uh, certainly uh, the uh, former students of, of Fermi adored him. Uh, one hears wonderful anecdotes by, uh, by people uh, who were associated with him. Uh, but as I say, I was just a little bit too young and too early in my career to have any real benefit from uh, the connection any direct benefit from the connection. John Simpson was one of the five appointees that Willie Zachariasen took to uh, President or Chancellor Hutchins in 1945. He was one of the younger participants in the Manhattan Project. Uh, so he was a very junior faculty member uh, when he joined the university faculty just after the Second World War. Uh, John was a very remarkable man. He, um, he got interested in neutron physics, which of course was the fashionable thing at the end of the uh, Met Lab, but his interests shifted to cosmic ray physics, and he became one of the leading figures in uh, space science. Uh, really beginning in the 1950s, uh, he uh, had a major um, uh, program to monitor the uh, incidence of cosmic rays on the Earth at various places, uh, locations on the Earth. He had a monitor in the Andes, and uh, I'm not sure of the, the total list of, of sites for his experiments. But he was doing ground-based uh, cosmic ray physics in the 50s. But when the opportunity came to go into space, he was one of the leaders. And he had experiments on a very large number of um, missions uh, put together by, uh, by NASA. But uh, there was a breadth there that was very interesting. 
Um, I talked with him for the first time when I was going through a reception line after the wedding of a classmate. And when I introduced myself to him, he immediately indicated that he knew the subject of my thesis project, although I had never had anything to do with him. But quite clearly, Chandra had told him something about what I was doing. Um, he was very good in his own way with undergraduates. He did not have a very good reputation as a lecturer, but he always had undergraduates working in the laboratory. And when an experiment was finished and it was time to write the paper, it had been a team collaboration, and the collaboration met. And the graduate students or the undergraduate students who had participated in the experiment were at the table, along with the postdocs and the research associates and the other colleagues. He was also very thoughtful in um, dealing with undergraduates who were, who were about to graduate and leave. He would tell the young person, I'm going to have to replace you. I want you to find for me a candidate and write a letter of recommendation. <laughs> so he really uh, had a thought. He spent a fair bit of time immediately after the war uh, going to Washington to advise and advocate for civilian control of nuclear energy. And in that effort, he became a colleague of Edward Levy, who was later president of the university and uh, attorney general under Gerald Ford. And so uh, Edward Levy and John Simpson became allies in the advocacy of civilian control of nuclear energy. Levy was acting as a consultant to one of the uh, um, legal consultant to one of the congressional committees, as I, as I recall. Uh, and it was clear that uh, there was a very collegial relationship between Levy and Simpson uh, that I had a, pr a privilege of, of witnessing very briefly in a receiving line when I followed uh, uh, John Simpson in greeting uh, Edward Levy. Uh, so John really created uh, space science at the university, and he created it in a way that connected it with the established Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And uh, there's a legacy there that uh, we all benefit from. Well, Edward Levy, right? Mr. Levy was uh, president of the university at a very difficult time in uh, the history of the, uh, of, of the country. Um, the 1968 uh, concern over the Vietnam War, the disruptions of the Democratic National Con Convention, et cetera. Um, there was an interesting development Around 1968, a basketball coach, Larry Hawkins, in the Chicago Public Schools, went to uh, President Levy of the university, and he essentially said, if there is a message that you want to get to young people on the side of Chicago, on the south side of Chicago, have the basketball coach deliver that message. He may be the only adult that young people on the south side of Chicago will uh, listen to. The result was the creation of the Office of Special Programs, which um, uh, Larry Hawkins came to direct. Um, it was a program that became a model for outreach programs in the United States. The organizing principle was to get high school students on the south side of Chicago to come to the campus and have a reason to feel at home. And the trick was, we have athletic facilities. We're going to let you use these facilities, but the quid pro quo is we also have classrooms, and we're going to make you sit there for enrichment as well. So uh, there was this. Um, program of educational outreach 
and uh, athletic activities, a carrot and a stick of a wonderful kind that has produced a wonderful generation of young African-American uh, alumni uh, from the south side of Chicago. Um, the faculty became very much involved. Uh, one of the leaders was a mathematics professor, Paul Sally, who was um, uh, really uh, the most charismatic of people for this kind of a, a role. Um, when I became aware of the program, Roger Hildebrand was the chair of the faculty advisory committee for the Office of Special Programs. And some years later, I became the chair of the outreach program. Uh, that outreach program was later um, embedded in the uh, uh, in CARA, the Consortium for Astrophysical Research in Antarctica. And we continue in astronomy and astrophysics to have uh, an outreach program which looks after students, high school students, uh, during the uh, uh, academic year. And then we have special programs uh, at the Yerkes Observatory in the summer. This kind of outreach effort has been replicated elsewhere so that on one of our tours of the campus, we um, uh, encountered Professor Waugh, uh, who was looking after students from the en Englewood neighborhood who were in a summer program uh, of outreach, uh, looked after essentially by the physics department and the Enrico Fermi Institute. And um, we have had other similar outreach programs uh, through other, other departments as well. So we are, uh, we try to be good neighbors to the community. And um, there was an occasion when um, Larry Hawkins, the leader of that program, who created the program in 1968, uh, received an award from the Hyde Park Historical Society. And in attendance were now a number of alumni of that program who are now at the level of mental management in various companies around the city. So it was a principle, have the basketball coach deliver the message and they'll listen. So. Um, uh, even now, we are uh, helping students accommodate. And I think the most important aspect of this program is a young person can walk from a classroom, say Cobb Hall, to um, the Ratner Athletic Facility with a sense, I have something to do here, and I belong here for that purpose. Um, well, in fact, we have uh, an education and outreach officer in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And uh, we participate in a variety of programs. We also have connections with the Adler Planetarium that are uh, quite strong. But that's a digression from... <laughs> Maybe you can tie these two together if it makes sense. Um, about the, the um, after the war, the Manhattan Project leaders and how, you know, what directions they, they took within the university. Well, the, um, the faculty, particularly in physics and chemistry, uh, when I was a student, was a community uh, very much dominated, I would say, by uh, participants in the Manhattan Project. Um, f five members of the faculty taught seven of the physics courses that I took. Samuel Allison, Willie Zachariasen, John Marshall, Murph Goldberger, um, who am I? Daryl Nagel. Um, 
They were obviously a community. Uh, Maria Mayer was on my dissertation committee. Um, I had the privilege of being best man when Maria Mayer's daughter married uh, my best friend in the physics department. Um, so it was a bit of family as well as, uh, and it, well, it was it was a very striking experience to be in the pres presence. You've been invited to Mount Olympus. <laughs> what can I say? Well, it was it was a it was a very distinctive faculty, but it was a faculty that clearly was past the Manhattan Project, and the different individuals were going in their respective ways. The emphasis on low energy nuclear physics, reactor physics, neutron physics had passed largely to the national laboratories where these subjects continued to be of interest in connection with weapons research and uh, in particular also with research on the possibilities for nuclear fusion as a, as a um, energy source. Uh, the accelerator building, uh, when it was completed, housed two of the high energy accelerators in the world. The major one was a 250 million electron volt synchrocyclotron, at that time one of the largest accelerators in the world. And there was a 100 million electron volt betatron. So if you wanted protons, you went to the uh, cyclotron. If you wanted electrons, you went to the betatron. Uh, and uh, these machines were the natural homes for uh, research on accelerator physics, research on elementary particle physics, and they were stepping stones to research on high energy physics. And so there was a natural um, uh, drift of people. Fermi, for example, was very much a leader in that direction. The theorists wanted very much to go in that direction because it was becoming clear that fundamental discoveries in uh, physics were going to depend on uh, the experimental use of high energy accelerators. And so the attractive physics was in a direction other than the more practical concerns of the uh, Met Lab and the Manhattan Project. And so John Simpson drifted into cosmic ray physics. Fermi was um, a leader in elementary particle physics. Uh, John Marshall and Daryl Nagel um, were leaders in uh, uh, ex accelerator f physics, in, in elementary particle physics. Um, when Roger Hildebrand joined the physics department, he and Darrell Nagel developed the first hydrogen bubble chamber, which became, their bubble chamber was uh, a little thing you could hold in your hand about the size of a shot glass. Uh, that was the ancestor of these huge bubble chambers that have been associated at uh, a certain his history in elementary particle physics with the very large machines. So uh, this is an example of people being attracted to uh, work addressing the most fundamental problems in, in uh, science. Uh, cosmic ray physics, John Simpson, Marshall Shine. Um, John Simpson brought Peter Meyer into the department. They became experimental physicists. They attracted uh, theorists like Eugene Parker, but that was the particle physics, astrophysics connection. Cosmic rays are a part of astronomy, contrary to the prejudices of certain physicists. <laughs> um, and particle physics is still an important part of what we do in the uh, cosmic ray. Particle astronomy is still an important part of what we do in um, 
uh, in uh, the, uh, the uh, department. Uh, there were other people, such as Robert Mulliken, who uh, essentially had always done atomic and molecular physics and essentially went back to atomic and molecular physics. Zachariasen continued to be an active X-ray crystallographer. Uh, he was a neighbor when our department was located in Ryerson. Um, Mark Ingram uh, was uh, doing uh, related experiments. Um, whom else should I be talking about? Um, of course, Mrs. Mayer continued as a member of the uh, department. Uh, Maria Guppert Mayer, um, uh, best known for her contributions to the nuclear shell model. Um, chemists um, were involved. Harold Urey, uh, Nathan Sugarman. Um, I put Norman Nachtrieb in that group. I'm not sure what he did during the Second World War. Uh, it's, it's important to realize that um, the Manhattan Project was not the only uh, big project during the uh, Second World War. A member of my own department, Gerard Kuiper, a very famous uh, astronomer, uh, was part of the Alsos uh, mission, which was a mission headed by Sam Gauchschmidt, uh, which was involved largely in collecting information about um, war research, and in particular nuclear research in Germany during the Second World War. Um, connections are very interesting. Uh, in May of 1945, the American Army had reached the Elba River from the west. Uh, and they stopped at the Elba River because the agreement uh, with, among the Allies was that the Russians were to be, the Soviets were to be in charge of the territory east of the Elba River. Uh, Gauchschmidt and Kuiper were at a location on the Elba River when uh, Kuiper learned that Max Planck, arguably the founder, well, the discovery of the Planck, the discoverer of the Planck constant. Uh, fair to say that Max Planck wrote the first paper in quantum theory, uh, right around the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. He was by this time a very el elderly senior citizen in the physics community in Germany. Planck had taken refuge in a farmhouse on the east side of the Elba River. At that point, this would have been May 16th, approximately, of 1945, uh, there was a no man's land between the Elba River and the advancing Soviet army. And Max Planck and his wife were in the path of the advancing Soviet army. Gerard Kuiper got permission from Gauchschmidt to mount a rescue operation. He grabbed two enlisted men and commandeered a jeep. They crossed the Elba River and they moved into Nobel, no man's land, which was probably a very risky trip. They found Professor and Mrs. Planck. They offered to take them to Göttingen and safety in the American zone and the Plancks were saved. Um, it's a story that I had never encountered until just recently, but it's well documented in a number of places. And uh, I knew Kuiper when I was a student, and I would not have put him in a Clint Eastwood role, except that as I reflect on it, he had a Dutch pragmatism. Here is a problem. This must be the solution. Okay, let's do it. <laughs>
And the irony is that Gauchmet's parents were lost in one of the German concentration camps, Nazi concentration camps during the war. Um, but that's another aspect of the Manhattan Project. And I guess it's part of the University of Chicago story that uh, Kuiper was uh, involved and uh, connected with uh, at least one rather brave exploit. This, by the way, is recorded in the Biographical Memoirs of the National Academy of Sciences in a very fine um, essay. Uh, so it, it's apparently a, a well-documented uh, event. I've read about it in other sources as well, although Kuiper never said a word. But one of the things that strikes me in um, this whole story, um, I was not involved in the Manhattan Project, but many of the participants in the Manhattan Project were among my teachers. And uh, I think I was exposed to a culture that was very much a legacy of the Met Lab and the Manhattan Project. But I have a sense that there was very little discussion, public discussion, of the Manhattan Project. Um, uh, we were not, we were not being exposed to a message. Well, uh, you are benefiting from the legacy of the Manhattan Project, or the, you know, the, uh, we we knew about the Manhattan Project. As I say, we lived in the shadow of the West Stands, and we saw the plaque commemorating the uh, December 2nd, 1942 events. But it was somewhat rare that um, we knew about uh, those connections. We did know that a number of members of the physics and chemistry departments would uh, travel to Los Alamos, particularly during the summer, to consult on various programs there. Uh, as I mentioned, um, my mentor Chandrasekhar was there when I was uh, working in Louis Rosen's lab. Um, but Fermi went with some regularity. Um, Richard Garwin uh, went. And um, uh, so we, we were aware that Los Alamos was uh, on the, in, uh, in the itinerary of uh, our, our teachers. But for me, the most striking exposure came uh, in physics colloquia, there was an endowed fund created to support what were called the Louis Sloton Lectures. Uh, Louis Sloton had joined the physics department as a research associate in the late 1930s and uh, was clearly a, a gifted young physicist highly regarded, had a variety of collaborations across the campus. He was involved in particular in the construction and operation of the cyclotron that was constructed on campus just prior to the uh, Second World War. And uh, he was recruited into the Manhattan Project. Uh, and he died tragically in an experiment uh, intended to uh, measure the critical masses of uh, elements like uranium and plutonium, critical masses for uh, self-sustained chain reactions. And uh, an experiment that he was doing uh, known as tickling the dragon's tail uh, involved bringing two subcritical masses of a um, reactive element together 
and monitoring the radiation emitted and from the measurements in f trying to deduce what the critical mass of that particular element would be for a self-sustaining reaction. And uh, it was a very crude experimental technique. Essentially, he was pushing one of the critical, subcritical masses with a screwdriver. The screwdriver slipped, the two masses came together, there was a massive emission of uh, neutrons. He was exposed and uh, he died tra tragically within a few days. He was fondly remembered in the physics department. And, uh, sorry, Sam Allison would make the introductions and he really cared and you just knew it was a tragedy. His recollections were very affectionate. And it was one of the rare occasions where there was a very explicit reference to the uh, Manhattan Project, to the Met Lab and the Manhattan Project. But apart from that kind of an event, and we knew that members of the um, uh, participants of the Manhattan Project were involved in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, for example. This was a, a hotbed of uh, activism uh, in connection with the proper control of nuclear energy. But um, as I say, with this rare exception, and, as I, and I remember the lecture or the introductions to these colloquia that Sam gave. And I guess it was particularly touching because um, Sam Allison was always a, a um, good source of a joke. He, you know, he, he always had a quip of, of one kind or another. I think it's, it's, it, it tells a lot about how you felt about this tragedy and, and uh, also about uh, Sam Al Allison. Uh, it talks a lot about the fraternity yeah. of the physicists. And you never met Louis Lowton, is that right? I never met Louis Lowton. Um, uh, very different generation. Um, of course, I have very fond recollections of Sam Allison. For the last uh, two years of my uh, graduate work, I was resident at the Yerkes Observatory. That's where Chandra was located, except for uh, traveling to the campus once a week. And um, we had two examinations for the PhD. There was a general examination which really sort of covered your coursework and your background knowledge and then there was the defense of the dissertation. Um, I would frequently ride to campus on Thursday when, with Chandra when he would drive into uh, the, uh, the campus. Um, so the evening before my first examination was to be held, Chandra came to my office at the Yerkes Observatory uh, to just discuss the, the uh, plans to leave Williams Bay to come down, Wisconsin to come down to the campus. The rule always was we would meet at a particular location at six o'clock, plus or minus 15 minutes. Um, and then Chandra would smile and he would say, I can be plus or minus. You must be minus. <laughs> but um, I commented to him that I had been spending a fair bit of time going over background for this examination. Chandra said, you people. You always knew you were going to be scolded a little bit when he said, you people. You don't know how to prepare for an examination. 
Your committee will not spend more than 15 minutes preparing for your examination. There's no reason for you to spend more than 15 minutes preparing for your examination. I suggested that I didn't see how that was possible. He said, well, you simply have to think about the questions they're going to ask you. And I said, that might be difficult to predict. He said, on the contrary, you take Sam Allison. Allison knows you're my student. He knows you are working in astrophysics. He knows I, Chandra, have worked on the H minus ion. The H minus ion is a hydrogen atom with an extra electron attached. And it is the principal source of the opacity of the outer layers of the sun to emerging radiation. Very important astrophysical subject. Allison knew that Chandra had worked in that field. So Chandra said, obviously, Allison is going to examine you on the H minus ion. For example, do you know the binding energy of H minus? And I gave him an answer, which Chandra corrected. And Chandra gave me about a 15 minute examination on H minus, and he grudgingly admitted that I probably would pass. <laughs> we got to the examination. Um, Chandra called on Mrs. Mayer to examine me first. You know, what, what, you know, I'm naming these names, and I'm just amazed at the good fortune that I and my classmates had in getting to know the extraordinary people that, that uh, we were allowed to know. So um, uh, Mrs. Mayer examined me, and I stumbled through it, uh, albeit apparently successfully. Um, Chandra then turned to Allison and said, Sam. Allison looked at me. He looked at the ceiling. He looked at me. He looked at Chandra. He looked at the ceiling. He looked at me. And he said, let us talk about the H minus ion. For example, do you know the binding energy of H minus? Chandra and I made eye contact, and it was not, it was impossible to avoid laughing. And of course, the rest of the committee is at a loss to know what's going on. My only course of action was honesty. I said, uh, Professor Chandrasekhar asked me that question yesterday evening. I told him I thought it was about seven tenths of a volt, and he told me it was closer to three quarters. Allison looked at me, he looked at the ceiling, he looked at Chandra, he looked at me, and he said, oh, let's talk about something else. For example, and then he examined me on alpha decay. <laughs> well, that's that, that, that's a, that, Allison had a nice had a nice uh, manner. Um, at a Fermi Institute seminar, and this was an interesting uh, process because um, the PhD members of the physics community would assemble in the uh, big seminar room in the old research institutes, and. Allison would occupy an easy chair on one side of the room at the front, and Gregor Wenzel, one of the uh, founders of quantum theory, uh, early pioneers of, of uh, quantum theory, was in the other easy chair. And a young man uh, gave a seminar. Uh, and by the way, this was a kind of Quaker meeting because Wenzel would turn around and he would say, does anyone here have something interesting to report? <laughs> and then you had to have the courage to volunteer to give a talk. <laughs> so a young man gave a, uh, a rather opaque account of recent work on nuclear form factors coming from the linear accelerator at Stanford. Now, form factors are a mathematical tool for describing the shapes of nuclei or elementary particles. At the end of the colloquium, the young man sat down, and Sam Allison leaned forward so that he could face Gregor Venzel. He said, Gregor, I'm very disturbed 
this was obviously a, 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 an important subject, and the young man obviously is a master of the subject. But I thought that I should have dis understood it better than I think I did. Because in the 1930s, when we were doing uh, X-ray physics in Ryerson, we used to talk about form factors. And all we meant was the Fourier transform of the charge distribution. Gregor, is that what he's talking about? <laughs> Benzel laughed and he said, yes, Sam, that's all he's talking about. <laughs> so, Allison had a way of, I think, being instructive without necessarily being offensive. <laughs> I did hear a story, I think it was from um, Dorothy Johnson. Dorothy Johnson had been Allison's secretary, I think at the Met Lab, and when he was director. And he was later the assistant to the Dean of the Division of, Sci of Physical Sciences. And I think she told the story uh, Harold Urey was giving a tour of his house to a number of colleagues. And uh, he pointed to the Nobel Prize medal and various things. And then he pointed to another award, uh, which was a fairly distinguished award. And um, he said, well, he was pleased to have it, but he didn't think too much of it. And Allison said, but Harold, that's the only award that I ever got. <laughs> uh, there, Harold Urey was a character, and that often showed up in um, uh, comments by uh, my colleagues. Again, he was regarded with enormous respect and, and affection. But he was also uh, somewhat eccentric, and this was uh, this was recognized. <laughs> but again, to be on a campus with all of these icons, and you went to a physics colloquium, and you didn't get near the first two rows. And the interesting thing from my point of view is that a number of people who subsequently received Nobel Prizes, I had the privilege of knowing before they got their Nobel Prizes. And as, I was, as, as, I, as far as I was concerned, the people who got Nobel Prizes were not necessarily distinguishable from the people who didn't. It was just an extraordinary physics department which was uh, a leg legacy of the Manhattan Project uh, that benefited very much from the leadership of scientists like Compton and Allison and Fermi, um, and from the uh, oversight of a university chancellor like Robert Maynard Hutchins. Well, there were two generations of graduate students. There was the group that came into the department just after the war, and many of these, for example, Mark Ingram and Murph Goldberger, had had their undergraduate degrees at the beginning of the Manhattan Project. And they had worked on the Manhattan Project, and they were experienced physicists when they came back to the department to work for their uh, PhDs. And the department was challenged to reject applicants, they simply, they could accommodate only so many graduate students, and they were rejecting applicants who in any other era would have been uh, slam dunk uh, admissions. And that was rather frightening to my generation, which was the next generation along, because we were now in the more conventional mode. Uh, graduate work was simply a stepping stone in my academic career. I did not have a lot of research experience uh, outside that 
people like Goldberger and, and Ingram had. Um, and it's interesting, uh, there are copies of candidacy examinations on file in the library. And if you go, say, from 1946 to 1952, approximately, they are, um, they are really daunting. Design a Betatron. That was one of the candidacy exam questions. How deep a hole can you dig? One of Fermi's questions was, estimate the number of piano tuners in the city of Chicago. Well, that's an interesting question because uh, scientists have to invent data from time. I mean, there's an apocryphal story that uh, two young people were stymied with some problem. And so uh, somebody said, we've got to go get Teller to guess some data for us. <laughs> but um, these were, I mean, Fermi was a source of, of questions with respect to life elsewhere in the universe. Fermi is famous for the question, where is everybody? He was a skeptic. <laughs> um, Chandra told a story that he and Fermi were collaborating on one of the papers that they published together in the Astrophysical Journal. And Chandra wanted to work through the details of a certain calculation. And Fermi said, oh, that wasn't necessary. We, we, we don't have to discuss that now. And um, Chandra was called away for a brief time, and he came back, and he found Fermi doing the calculation. <laughs> he said, I've caught you. <laughs> Um, yeah. I want to pick up on something you just mentioned, uh, you'd mentioned as we were chatting before we've got the camera going, about um, women scientists. Um, you know, we know about Leona. Uh, you mentioned a, a woman uh, at MIT. Uh, and if you could tell something of those. Uh, we, um, times for women. women in science is a subject with a very difficult history. Um, for example, well, you asked about the lady at MIT. When I was a graduate student, uh, a, another student, Millie Reif, uh, she's now uh, Millie Dresselhaus, was a graduate student a year or two ahead of me. I think she had done a Fulbright in England uh, and, in fact, did her Ph.D. thesis essentially under the supervision of that mentor. Um, the university is very good at uh, negotiating irregular arrangements. And... Um, uh, she married uh, her current husband, Dresselhaus. What is his first name? I forget now. But um, she followed him to Cambridge when he got a postdoctoral appointment. Where he, I guess he was a junior faculty member here at the time, and he moved to MIT. And Millie was looking for a job. And she found something in the Lincoln Labs. And there is a wonderful history where she simply proved her worth to the point that she was appointed first as a professor in engineering and then became a professor in physics and is one of the MIT University professors, which is one of approximately half a, half a, approximately a dozen most senior professorships at MIT. So here is this lady who had a certain struggle. Uh, she, she met the usual obstacles. She went to Cambridge as the spouse. And, uh, oh, something has to be found for Dresselhaus's wife. 
you know, that was the the uh, the problem. And um, it's interesting. Um, I did the paperwork when the Assum Alumni Association of the University of Chicago uh, conferred the Alumni Medal on Millie a few years ago. And my principal resource was a biographical essay on Millie by her husband. And that was the most charmingly affectionate bit of biographical writing that you could wish. Uh, he was so proud and so honored <laughs> to be a spouse of this extraordinary lady. Uh, and she is an acknowledged leader in carbon chemistry um, in the world. Um, one of my colleagues quoted her, uh, if you're a woman in science, one of the secrets of success is to be sure to have your babies on Saturdays. <laughs> uh, so that was an interesting case. Um, Maria Guppert Mayer uh, was a very accomplished physicist at the beginning of the Second World War. Uh, at the end of the war, her husband, Joseph Mayer, a physical chemist, was appointed to the chemistry department and the uh, Fermi Institute. But the university had nepotism rules. So Mrs. Mayer, you know, there was not a position at uh, the university for the spouse. Happily, Robert Sachs was in a senior position in the theoretical division at Argonne, and he gave Mrs. Mayer a job. And she was assigned to be in residence on the campus of the University of Chicago to provide liaison between the physics department here and the theoretical division at the Oregon. Uh, another one of these very creative solutions to a silly problem. Uh, she was always listed in the catalog as a volunteer professor of physics. Her university title had the adjective volunteer attached to it. Uh, from all accounts, she was de facto, maybe not de jour, but de facto, a full um, member, senior member of the physics department. And uh, when she won the Nobel Prize, the word is there was nobody happier than her husband, Joe. The university became interested, the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics became um, uh, interested in uh, adding to the faculty a very accomplished and distinguished woman astronomer, an observational astronomer in England. And uh, the department began negotiations with her to appoint her to the faculty. But Part of that negotiation was that the um, university would guarantee a staff research position for her husband, a theoretical astrophysicist. Uh, when the university raised the possibility of providing a staff position for her husband, the lady simply said that would not work. And uh, she argued that her husband, who was fully qualified, should be appointed to the faculty position, and she would accept the research associateship. As members of our department, they functioned comparably as full members of the faculty. The lady attended faculty meetings and voted, often in conflict with her husband on particular matters. Um, so that is another example. Um, uh, the couple left. They have had distinguished careers. The husband is, is no longer with us. Um, so again, 
you find ways to, to cope. And I will say that in today's world, we would almost certainly appoint both of them to the faculty. But our culture was healthy enough that de facto, if not de jure, they were equivalent members of our senior faculty. There is a, another example. Um, in 1960, I attended, uh, I was just drifting into astrophysics formally, and I attended a summer school on the galactic system, the Milky Way in the Netherlands. And there was a classmate at that summer school, Vera Rubin, a name you might well want to look up. Uh, her husband was a physicist, and early in her career, she followed her husband as the spouse. But when we were together at the summer school in the Netherlands, she was already an experienced an accomplished, opinionated astronomer. Um, interestingly, the anonymous husband and wife team uh, that I just described were on the uh, among the lecturers at this summer school, and Vera Rubin had an opportunity to begin working with them. And she started working on the observations of an interpretation of the rotations of spiral galaxies. And um, professionally, as I say, she followed her husband. She came under the mentorship of George Gamow and uh, got a PhD on the strength of the thesis on structure in the universe, which was a pioneering thesis, but which could only be published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences because Gamow was a member. And uh, when, they wanted, when the members of the National Academy want something published, it's published. Uh, Vera went to work with her mentors in the spiral structure, well, in the structures of spiral galaxies, and took up that work in collaboration with Kent Ford, uh, where she was employed in the Carnegie Institution. And she is credited as being one of the earlier discoveries and uh, expositors of the evidence for the existence of dark matter in the universe. Uh, now she's on everybody's short list for people. Uh, she's getting rather, uh, rather frail now, but uh, she was part of the, uh, she was sort of the same uh, generation as Millie Dresselhaus. And so I regard these ladies as, as uh, elder sisters in whom I stand of, uh, uh, in awe. Um, well, again, an example of a woman who went through that very difficult transition period before we learned to recognize the equivalence of the genders in uh, all of the respects in which we should be recognizing that equivalence. So among my bits of good fortune has been the opportunity to know some extraordinary ladies who um, I've encountered in, in, in science and I can count as friends or mentors uh, or colleagues or classmates. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that the most distinguished current member of the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics is Wendy Friedman, who uh, was the leader in modern efforts to measure Hubble's constant. 
and the uh, chairman of our astronomy and astrophysics department is Angela Olinto, who is a distinguished service professor. So, um, and uh, we've been hiring some extraordinary young women, and I think roughly half of our graduate student population is now female, that, of that order. And uh, some of them are among our best students, uh, NSF fellows, uh, dissertation uh, fellowships, uh, things of that sort. So um, we're finally getting it right. We still have a way to go. We have a long way to go. Um, women are still a minority on the faculty of our department, but uh, we are now uh, we are now rather even-handed in our uh, treatment of faculty appointments.